On today's show, we're going to run through five moves that George and Sean Payton could make to help the Broncos get under the salary cap because they have some fat to trim. Actually, the Broncos right now are at about $24 million over the salary cap. So they have some moves to make to before uh, the beginning of the new league year. And when you look at their biggest cap hits in 2024, I know a lot of you have some wishful thinking of, oh, if you move on from Russell Wilson, that'll help. No, no, not at all, actually. So ignore the idea of cutting Russell Wilson will help. It will not. Um, Garrett Bowles, Zach Allen, Mike McGlinchey have the next biggest cap hits. I don't see Zach Allen or Mike McGlinchey going anywhere after their first season in Denver. Justin Simmons, Cortland Sutton, Tim Patrick are names to watch for. Same goes for Ben Powers. He just signed. He's not going anywhere. And then you've got Jerry, Judy, and DJ Jones to round it out. So let's run through my five-step plan to help Denver create some cap space and get below the salary cap, starting with releasing Tim Patrick. This one stings, but this is those moments where you go, it's a business. And unfortunately, the injuries have potentially ruined Tim Patrick's career. I know that sounds a bit dramatic, but man, he was looking so promising after that 2021 season and then missed all of 2022 and all of 2023. He's got a $15.5 million cap hit. If the Broncos move on from him before June 1st, meaning don't make him a post-June 1 designation, they could save nearly $10 million. Remember, they've got to trim about 25-ish million just to get below zero, or back to zero. So 10 million could go a long way right there. I think Tim Patrick, though, may offer to take a bit of a pay cut. That's probably what he's going to be offered, which is, hey, there's no way we can afford to keep you on the books for this number. If you're willing to take a massive pay cut, similar to what Graham Glasgow did a couple of years ago, maybe Denver would entertain holding on to him, knowing that his cap hit would go down. And listen, if I'm Tim Patrick, I understand this is a mixed bag of emotions, but ultimately, if someone's offering you a paycheck after missing all of 2023 and all of 2022, even if for a fraction of what you were originally due, I would think long and hard about passing up on that opportunity. So let's say Denver does move on from Tim Patrick. Well, their updated cap space after that would be about $14.4 million. There might be a couple hundred Gs I'm forgetting here or there, but that's just a good ballpark range. So moving on from Tim Patrick is not going to be enough to get Denver back to zero. Before we move on to step number two, I do want to show TP some love right now, though. Spam81 in the comment section. If Tim Patrick does get released by Denver and then has a tremendous season elsewhere, I'm always going to be pulling for him. He's the glue guy. He's the guy that brings beer to the party when it's starting to wrap up to keep things going. Tim Patrick is always going to go down as one of the most awesome random Broncos players that, you know, unfortunately injuries really derailed what could have been a very promising career. Step number two, extend Garrett Bowles. I thought about which way to go about Garrett Bowles for a while. You could extend him, could trade him, you could release him. I don't think Denver's going to release him. So let's ignore the releasing element. And this might sound a bit ironic coming from me since I was not the biggest Garrett Bowles fan this time last year. But after his 2023 season, you could argue maybe his second best season. Like that 2020 year, he was truly on top of the world. But this year, he gave up only three sacks, two hits, eight penalties. Penalties were his biggest issues early on in his career. And he really got them under control over the last two to three seasons. In fact, when you look at Garrett Bowles' PFF career grades, I mean, you can just see that he's kind of getting to a point where the norm is him maybe not being a top 10 tackle, but he's definitely in the top 25 conversation. And if you look around the NFL right now, I mean, the game is always changing, but a position that's going up in value is offensive tackle. Because teams know that without a starting quarterback, they're sunk. I mean, look at the four final teams in the AFC and the NFC, right? In the AFC, you had Patrick Mahomes and Lamar Jackson. Not only are those guys just great players, but they also played and stayed healthy the entire season. In the NFC, you had Brock Purdy and Jared Goff, also healthy the entire season. So you're not going to get very far with a banged-up quarterback. And so tackles are so valuable right now that if you can find one that, sure, might not be a top-10 tackle, maybe $20 million is a little bit rich, 
But if a slight overpay means your quarterback stays healthy, that's the price of doing business. So here's what I think an extension could look like. It's a three-year, $55 million extension. He's over 30 years old, so I don't think it's going to be as big as his first contract extension was. That comes out to an average of $18.3 million, so slightly below his $20 million average from his previous contract. But you guarantee 40 of it, so it's basically a two-year, $40 million contract, which is right where he is right now. So if that's not interesting to you, if you don't want to extend Garrett Bowles, if you don't think he is the long-term guy at left tackle, a cornerstone piece, here's what a trade could look like, because Denver's not going to release him. They could at least get something for him in a trade. His cap is $20 million. His dead cap is $4 million. His cap savings is $16 million. So you could get a lot of money off your books if you traded Garrett Bowles away. Now, my issue with trading Garrett Bowles away is this. You trade Garrett Bowles away, what are you going to do immediately in the draft? Draft a new left tackle, right? It'd be one thing if Denver had drafted a left tackle last year. He looked good in training camp and preseason. And they're like, you know what? We think he's ready to step into a starting role. But that's not the case. Like They don't have anyone in the wings right now. They don't have anyone in their farm system ready to step up and become a starting left tackle. So if we're just trading Garrett Bowles away just to turn around and draft a brand new left tackle that may or may not be as good as Bowles, that's just too big of a risk to me. What happens if he's not as good as him? Which Garrett Bowles is a top 20 tackle in football right now. Ask that rookie to come in and say, hey, you better be as good as that last guy because the only reason why we traded him away was because we want to get a little bit of money off our books, but we also thought you could be just as good. Now, the good news is, ish, this draft class is loaded at tackle. If there was ever a year to try and revamp or redo your offensive line, this is the draft class to do it. I think we might see six. I almost want to say seven, but I know that's too much, but five to six offensive tackles go in round one. It's that deep of a draft class. Now, let's say that Denver does extend Garrett Bowles. I can't put an absolute number as to what kind of cap relief get that gets them because they could spread his cap out over the remaining years of his contract. But that could bring Denver down to about 2 or bring Denver to $2 million. And now we're in the green, right? Now we are below the salary cap, and they've got $2 million to spend. Now, teams don't want to go into the season with just $2 million. One, you have to sign all of your draft picks, and Denver does have a first-round draft pick this year, so that number is already budgeted in a little bit. But you also want to have some money to spend during the season in case you need to sign someone because an injury happens, and you want to have a little bit of slush money. So with that being said, if you're looking for some cap-saving crumbs, right, some quarters in between couch cushions, if you move on from these guys, here's how much you're saving each. Samaj P. Ryan, $3 million. Chris Manhart's $2.1 million. Trayman Smith, $2.5 million. And then who remembers the Iowa State Cyclone who was indefinitely suspended for gambling? Yeah, Iwama Wazuike, you could save a little under a million dollars. I mean, you take all four of these bad boys here, we're talking eight to nine-ish million dollars. That's a good chunk of change for a third running back, a blocking tight end, and a cornerback who didn't play corner and didn't play special teams, so he doesn't really have a role anymore on this team. And then a guy who is gambling, so he got suspended. I'm interested in that, but those are just like cap-saving crumbs. Next up on the show, we're going to talk about how the Broncos could get even more money in cap relief if you are interested in that. But first, I do want to share with you guys our sponsor today, which is Prize Picks. We all know the big game is coming up, and if you want to have some bonus fun while watching the big game, get started with Prize Picks today. It's super simple and user-friendly. All you do is pick two to six players, choose more or less on their projected stats. Now, if that's not simple enough for you, let me give you an example of my selections for this upcoming Sunday. I'm going with the more on Patrick Mahomes at 0.5 passing yards. Love him, hate him, despise him. I think he's capable of throwing for one passing yard. I also like the more on Isaiah Pacheco at half a rushing or receiving touchdown. And then finally, I like the more for Brock Purdy's passing yards at 248 and a half. So if you like my selections, feel free to ride with me. At the very least, get with Prize Picks today. Go to prizepicks.com slash CLNS and use code CLNS. When you, know that when you do those two things, you're going to get a $100 deposit match. 
Then go to the Patrick Mahomes player stat projection, take the more on half a passing yard, and then pick whatever other stat projection you like, and you're already halfway home. So get started today. All that information is in the comments and description of today's video. Move number three. Now, I will preface with, at this point, Denver could do the first two things and pretty much be good to go, right? Add in a couple of those small releases, those salary cap crumbs, and they don't have to go much further. But if you are interested in maximizing their salary cap space for 2024, you could trade Cortland Sutton or Jerry Judy. Now, here's how the money shakes down for these two players. Jerry Judy is on a fully guaranteed fifth-year option at $12.9 million, which means it's as simple as it gets. If you trade him, you get $12.9 million off your books. If you release him, you have $12.9 million in dead cap. Like, there is no wiggle room here. Now, sometimes when players have fully guaranteed fifth-year options and they get traded, the team trading them away will eat some of that money to help get a better draft pick in return. Kind of like when Von Miller went to the Rams and the Broncos still paid his salary to get a second and a third. Now, Cortland Sutton is a little bit more hairy. His cap hit is $17.2 million. The dead cap hit, if you were to trade him before June 1, is $7.6 million. The cap savings, $9.6 million. So almost $10 million in savings if Cortland Sutton were to get traded. Now, Cortland Sutton comes off of a career year in a lot of ways. Like 772 yards, might not scream career year, went over 1,000 back in 2019, but he did haul in 10 touchdowns. So teams are going to take a good hard look at that number. And then you got Jerry Judy, one of the quickest and best route runners in the league, who unfortunately has just not blossomed into that true wide receiver one Denver thought they were getting out of the 15th overall pick in the draft. The only path I see for either of those players getting traded is if a team calls the Broncos and offers what Denver was looking for last season for Jerry Judy. Because last season, the price tag was allegedly a first or a second and a player. And Denver didn't want to trade Jerry Judy. So what do they do? They put a somewhat ridiculously asking high asking price, knowing it's not so far out of the realm of possibility that there's a 0% chance a team calls, but unless they blow him away with an offer... They're going to stand pat. Now, fast forward a year later. Why has Jerry Judy's trade value gone down? One, he's got one less year on his rookie contract. If a team traded for him last year, they have two years on that rookie deal. Now it's just one before they are forced to make a decision to extend him or re-sign him to a big contract, right? Two, he didn't play all that well this past season. Guy caught two touchdowns. So his trade value is lower than it was a year ago, which is why I think Denver knows, listen, if we can get below the salary cap without having to move on from one of these two players, let's not move on from one of them. Because the last thing we want to do is go, let's draft a rookie QB, start him, and then you know that starting wide receiver? We just traded him away. That doesn't seem like that's a good idea to help progress your new rookie quarterback. So let's just say Denver decides to make some trades, okay? If they were to trade Jerry Judy away, they would get about $13 million total in cap space. So that's a good amount of you know money to spend if there was a free agent or two out there they wanted to bring in. Let's say they trade away Cortland Sutton. It's not going to be quite as big. Now, the Jerry Judy one's a little bit more difficult because Denver may have to eat some of that $12.9 million. And in that case, they would have less cap space available. But this gives you a good idea of what the cap space availability would look like with either trade going down. Now, if you were to predict one of these two receivers gets traded, who do you think it's going to be? Jerry Judy or Cortland Sutton? Both pros, both cons. I think Judy is more likely to get dealt than Cortland Sutton. But let me know what you think down below in the comment section. Move number four, release DJ Jones. Now, you could argue to slide DJ Jones to up this, uh, up this list a little bit. I mean, look at the financial side of it. Very low dead cap hit, $2.9 million. A cap savings of nearly $10 million. So why is DJ Jones all the way at number four? Shouldn't this be one of the first moves the Broncos make? And maybe, right? When you look at the season he had in 2023, 46 tackles, five tackles for loss. Pro Football Focus ranked him 80th out of 130 qualifying tackles. But the reason why I've got him at number four and not earlier in my list is 
what's their plan of succession? Look at Denver's defensive line. Jonathan Harris is a free agent. Mike Purcell is a free agent. Wazurike is probably going to be suspended. Are you rolling with Elijah Garcia or Jackson or Matt Henningsen, the now 30-year player out of Wisconsin? That's a pretty big roll of the dice right there. You could draft a new defensive tackle, but you've already got a big list of needs, and defensive tackle is one of them. So moving on from two of your three starters, when albeit it was not a very good room last year, you're somewhat digging yourself into a deeper hole. So I could see Denver holding on to DJ Jones because they don't want to make more fires to put out. And moving on from Jones, that's one more guy they got to replace at a spot where it's not really good as it is. So we'll see what happens at DJ Jones' position. Now, if they move on from DJ Jones, we're looking at a cap hit or cap savings now of $23 million in total. So this is combined with all the other moves we talked about. Denver goes from being negative $25 million in the hole to being $23 million in the green. And finally, move number five, trade Justin Simmons. I don't like this move. I don't. I can understand that this is a possibility, though. And that's why I put it on the list. I put it number five, though, at the very bottom of my list. Justin Simmons has been the best ball hawk safety, in my opinion, really since he entered the league, like from his second year on. You look at what he's done over the last four seasons, nine interceptions the last two years. If three picks is a quote-unquote down year for Simmons, I'll take it. The guy before that had 10 combined interceptions. No one has more interceptions, I think, than Justin Simmons since like 2018. So I'm not looking to trade Justin Simmons. But $18.2 million is a big cap hit for a safety approaching maybe towards the end of their career. And there's a small dead cap hit and a big amount of cap savings. So maybe Denver decides we don't want to move on from Jerry Judy or Cortland Sutton. But we've got some young safeties. We're ready to roll with J.L. Skinner or Hopefully not to Laren Turner Yell, but PJ Locke or Caden Stearns and draft a guy or something like that. And let's get nearly $15 million in savings and we'll get a draft pick out of it. Now, a team I've heard floated out about, about floated out there about a potential Justin Simmons trade destination has been the Detroit Lions. I feel like after CJ Gardner Johnson waved 49ers fans goodbye in the first quarter when the Lions proceeded to blow a 24 7 lead and lose. Maybe Detroit decides, let's bring an actual leader into our defense like Simmons. And in exchange, Denver would get a third-round pick, in my opinion. So, if all five of those moves happen, Broncos are looking at about 40-ish million dollars in salary cap spending money. That's a good amount of money to spend. Now, they don't have to make all those moves, but they are likely going to make a few of those moves. So would you trade Justin Simmons? To wrap up the show, let me know in the comment section. I don't want to trade Justin Simmons. He just screams Denver Bronco for life. And I would love to see him stay in Denver. And as he's been a part of so many down years, hopefully he can be a part of the future good years for Broncos country.